Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked extensively about the three major gluteal muscles, and I say major really because those are the ones that we typically think of as the gluteal muscles, the ones that share the name gluteus, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. Okay. Um, but we have several other muscles in the gluteal area, uh, and they are deep gluteal muscles. And sometimes kind of differentiating between these is a pain in the butt, no pun intended there. Um, but what's common about all the ones we're about to talk about is they're what we call lateral rotators. Okay? So these muscles, if they were to contract, they facilitate lateral or external rotation of the hip. Okay, or of the thigh, if you want to consider it that way. Um, in fact, if you actually knocked out the action of all of these muscles, basically uh, made it to where they could not contract at all, you would actually have, uh, by default, a net um, adduction and internal or medial rotation of the thigh. Um, and that would be something observed whether you're standing or sitting. So these are very important for preventing excess uh, internal rotation, also called medial rotation. And so we're going to go through these muscles one by one, and we're going to talk about their origins, their insertions, their innervation, so what nerve supplies them, and then talk about their actions. Uh, they're all going to be lateral or external rotators, but some of them are going to have some other auxiliary functions. Okay? But their main function is as lateral rotators of the hip. Okay? And we're going to begin with the piriformis muscle. Now, The piriformis muscle, just so you're aware, actually is named based on its shape. It's kind of unintuitive. Uh, but actually, when you look at this muscle in a cadaver, it resembles a pear. Um, so pear piriformis, that's where it gets its name, has the form of a pear. Now, the nice thing about this muscle is that it's the only one of these that originates on the sacrum. So here's our sacrum right here. I'm actually going to move this out of the way for just a minute. Um, we have an intact pelvis here. Here's our sacrum. And the origin of the piriformis is really on the sacrum, about at the levels of the second through the fourth sacral foramina. Okay? And the fibers are going to run laterally, and the muscle is going to insert on the greater trochanter. So let me actually move this back. So the insertion of this muscle is going to be on the greater trochanter. Okay. Now before we get into the nerve supply and the actions, I want to mention one general thing about all of these lateral rotators. If you'll notice, all the origins are actually medial. Okay. Even though the piriformis is the only one to originate on the sacrum, all of these others, their origin is over here somewhere on the pelvis. Their insertions are all on the femur, some part of the femur, proximal part, and so their insertions are lateral origins are medial. So you still have to do the work of memorizing them, so to speak, but if you get confused, remember the origins are all medial. So here I've got the full table. Uh, the insertion of the piriformis is going to be on the greater trochanter, uh, just like the vast majority of the external rotators, although there are going to be some exceptions. Um, the nerve supply is nerve to the piriformis, very original. And in addition to being an external rotator of the hip, the piriformis is going to have some role in hip extension. Now, again, for all of these, the rotation part is the major function. Okay? And they all work collectively. These other functions, like hip extension for the piriformis, are minor, and they only aid in that. Um, if we're looking at hip extension, recall the major muscle that's involved there is really going to be the gluteus maximus. And uh, when we talk about the hamstrings, there's a few uh, parts of the hamstrings that also aid in hip extension. That's just an auxiliary function of the piriformis. All right? Now, the other ones all seem to cluster down here. And I'm actually going to switch over to this slide. I've got a second one here that actually has um, a better view of some of these muscles. The next two that we're going to look at, we're going to look at together. Those are the gemellus superior, or superior gemellus, and the obturator internus. Okay. Now, let's take a look at those. So if we look at the origin and insertion of those two, superior gemellus, this one's going to originate on the ischial spine. So if we follow this muscle right here over, we actually see this spike right here on the ischial region of the oscoxa, that is the right oscoxa, and this spine is the ischial spine. So that's going to be our origin of the superior gemellus. Okay? If we follow the fibers over, uh, we can see that it's going to insert 
on the greater trochanter of the femur. Okay, so here's our greater trochanter right in this area. That's the insertion. Now, the obturator internus right here is going to have its origin right here on the obturator membrane. Okay, and part of that membrane is covered up by this ligament right here. Uh, this would actually be of the sacrotuberous ligament, I believe. But before we go any further, let's answer the question, what is the obturator membrane? Well, here's a fully intact pelvis. We're looking at an anterior view. And recall that we have these giant holes right here, one on each side that flank the pubic symphysis. These are called the obturator foramen. Okay? Now, if we're just looking at the bone without anything else intact, it would just be a hole, right? That's the obturator foramen. But when we have everything intact in vivo, the vast majority of this foramen is covered in this ligamentous structure called the obturator membrane. And there's only a tiny space up here on the superior aspect of the foramen called the obturator canal. And it turns out that there's some uh, vessels and a nerve, the obturator nerve, that move through that. But the majority of the foramen is covered by this obturator membrane. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is if you imagine for a moment, you know, you've probably seen a pelvis, an intact pelvis in uh, one of your anatomy labs. You could imagine sticking your hand inside the pelvis, right? You could stick it through the pelvic inlet. And you could imagine sticking your finger in there and feeling the obturator membrane from the inside, right? You could feel the obturator membrane internally. Or you could just have your finger outside the pelvis, kind of like where my mouse is, and you could feel the obturator membrane from the outside. You could feel it externally. Okay? You might be able to see where I'm going with this. Well, there's two muscles. They're both obturator muscles. There's obturator internus and obturator externus. We're talking about the internus right now. So the origin of the obturator internus is on the obturator membrane. However, it's on the side of the obturator membrane that's on the inside of the pelvis. So here it's a posterior view. But in this view, if we were to actually see where the obturator internus would originate, it would actually be behind this obturator membrane because it would have to be internal, inside the pelvis. Okay? The obturator externus, as we'll see in a few minutes, is going to originate on the outside, on the external aspect of the obturator membrane. And so really the only origin you'd be able to see from this view is the obturator externus origin. In this view, we can see the obturator internus origin. Okay, So hopefully I beat that to death and it makes sense. If we follow the fibers over, we see that uh, the obturator internus is going to again insert on the greater trochanter. Now the reason I grouped the obturator internus and superior gemellus together is because they share a similar nerve supply. Uh, here's these two right here, our full table. Notice that both of these muscles, obturator internus and superior gemellus, they both uh, are innervated by this nerve, nerve to obturator internus. Very creative name, I know. But that's why we group them together. And also because they have exactly the same function. Again, they are external rotators of the hip, or lateral rotators. And their auxiliary function, which is minor, they just aid in it, or they assist, would be hip extension. All right, let's look at the next two that we're going to group together. Those are the inferior gemellus and the quadratus femoris. All right, so let's actually take a look at them on this slide right here. So here is our gemellus inferior or inferior gemellus. If we look at its origin, it's going to be on the ischial tuberosity. Recall the spine is up here. So this part right here that kind of bulges out, this is going to be our ischial tuberosity, origin of the gemellus inferior. Following the fibers laterally, we see that it's going to insert once again on the greater trochanter. Okay. Common theme for what we've seen so far. However, the quadratus femoris is going to have a different origin. So here's our quadratus femoris. It's the most inferior, I guess you could say, of all of these. It's also going to originate on the ischial tuberosity right here. And as we follow the fibers laterally, we see it does not actually insert on the greater trochanter up here. It inserts distally to that on this ridge called the intertrochanteric crest. Right. Now, when we look at these two muscles, 
The reason we group inferior gemellus and quadratus femoris is, again, they share a similar nerve supply. Uh, they're both innervated by the nerve to the quadratus femoris, right? And again, they also share the same functions. Uh, they're both external or lateral rotators of the thigh. And again, they have an auxiliary function of hip extension, but they just assist in that. That's not their main function. Main function is as external rotators. All right. What do we have left? Well, we have left the obturator externus. Now, the obturator externus, we're not going to be able to see from this view, okay? Um, but hopefully, you can at least understand that it's going to originate on the obturator membrane, but not from this side, okay? In fact, we won't even be able to see it from this side, okay? However, the origin would actually be on this aspect of the obturator membrane, okay? So even though there's no muscles visible here, it would originate from this side of the obturator membrane externally. Therefore, the name is obturator externus. Now, for the insertion, we can see a little bit here, okay? We have to imagine that we're looking right here face on on the uh, internal aspect of the obturator membrane. So behind all these muscles and behind the membrane on the other side would be its origin. But we can actually see a little bit of the fibers kind of coming through here. And these fibers of the obturator externus are going to go laterally, and they're actually going to insert on the trochanteric fossa. Okay? So they're not inserting on the greater trochanter, they're inserting on the trochanteric fossa. All right? And looking at the nerve supply to the obturator externus, it's going to be due to the obturator nerve. Now, uh, this is one of the first cases where we see a break in the actions. Okay? Um, the obturator externus is still going to promote lateral rotation or external rotation of the hip. However, it is the only one here that's going to assist in hip adduction. Okay? Now, obviously, that's an auxiliary function. It assists in that. We have an entire muscle group called the adductor group that's going to be uh, facilitating hip adduction. But there's going to be a small amount of that that's aided by the obturator externus. Okay? But once again, it's a lateral or external rotator. Okay? We are not going to be discussing tensor fascia latte in this video. Um, the reason being is because it's a very different muscle, has very different functions, as you can see here. Um, some sources will actually group it with these muscles, not based on the action or anything, but really just because it's in that proximity, same location. Um, but we'll be covering this uh, later in other videos. Okay. So at this point, hopefully, you have a better understanding of where some of these deep gluteal muscles are and what their functions are, and also how to differentiate the obturator internus from the externus. Now, very important that you can be able to do that, and it's based on what aspect of the obturator membrane the muscle originates on. Okay, So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.